Hello, everybody. Welcome. I'm so glad that you've joined us here. I'm going to ask everybody to uh, mute themselves, please. And we are very happy to have Jeffrey Chandler with us today. And uh, we are um, going to talk about his book, which <laughs> I'm going to share my screen with you so you can see his um, the the timeline of his book in just a second. Okay. So first I wanna tell you a little bit about the Jewish Language Project. My name is Sarah Bunin Benor and I run the Jewish Language Project of Hebrew Union College. Our mission is to promote research mm -hmm. on, awareness about, and engagement surrounding the many languages spoken and written by Jews throughout history and around the world. Um, and I'm just going to ask everyone to mute themselves, please. I can't figure out who's noise right now, so I can't mute you, but please uh, mute yourself. Um, so the most urgent task in the work that we do is documenting endangered languages. And we do this with a consortium of organizations, um, including the Endangered Language Alliance, Mother Tongue, and Wiki Tongues, and several other organizations. And Another important component of what we do is raising awareness about Jewish languages. We do this through our website, jewishlanguages.org, and by posting fun facts like the ones you just saw in that intro on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We post every Monday and Thursday, uh, special days in the Jewish calendar. And we post videos on YouTube periodically, including some original songs that we have, um, we have commissioned and also some documentation videos that we've created with our partners in the consortium. And we also have events. Uh, we have had events on Jewish English, Ladino, Bukharian, Judeo-Arabic, Sephardic Jewish Papiamentu, which is spoken in the Caribbean, and Iranian Jewish languages, and events like the one we are having today. And we are so happy that Jeffrey Chandler has joined us today. And I'm uh, going to ask Hannah to spotlight Jeffrey now so that we can all be on the same screen and let's see if there we are uh jeffrey oh no i can't see jeffrey right now let's see there we go hi jeffrey so um, yeah, so I'm um, so glad to have you here. Jeffrey Chandler is a professor of uh, at Rutgers University. What is your title, Jeffrey? Uh, my title is I'm actually a distinguished professor uh, in the Department of Jewish Studies at Rutgers. Wonderful. And he has written so many books about Yiddish and Jewish culture. And today we're focusing on his book called Biography of a Language, Yiddish Biography of a Language. And I'm just going to share the table of contents with you so you can understand the organizing principle of this book. It is a biography of Yiddish, and it is organized by date and place of birth, family background, residence, name, gender, etc., the kinds of things you would expect to have in a biography. And so I'm going to start by asking you, Jeffrey, what is the um, rationale for this organizing principle. Okay, well, first, thank you for uh, inviting me to uh, speak with you today and to be part of the Jewish Language Project, which is uh, doing such uh, interesting and important work. Uh, and I, uh, I'm, I'm, I'm a regular follower and it's great, uh, it's great to see the, the range of activities and the range of languages that you're pursuing. And as I said, I'm happy to be part of that. 
So the story of this book is as follows. Uh, this book uh, was a commission. And what happened was one day I got an email from an editor at uh, Oscar, Oxford University Press, which is the publisher of this book. Uh, and they said, uh, we have a series called Biography of a Language. And there's a book on German. There's a book on Dutch. We'd like to have one on Yiddish. Would you like to write it? And I thought, well, that's an interesting proposition. But before I could answer, I had some questions of my own. And uh, the first question, and really the most important one was, if this is a book in a series, does it have to follow a particular format? Because very often when university presses publish a series of books, those books have actually a very uh, specific rubric that they must follow. And if that was the case, I wasn't sure that was something uh, I, I would want to do. But the editor wrote back and said, no, uh, you come up with your own format. And if you look at the two books that have already appeared, you'll see that each one is structured differently. So I um, went online. I went uh, to look at, uh, you know, when you can look on a website and you can look inside and see the table of contents of a book and the uh, introduction and so on. And each of these books is organized uh, differently, but they are basically histories of their respective languages, which got me thinking, so why isn't this called history of a language or the story of a language or introduction to a language? What's with biography? And I also noticed when uh, typing in a search engine biography of a, uh, you get books on all kinds of things other than a person. And of course, conventionally, we think a biography is a book about a person, but there's a biography of a river, a biography of a building, a biography of a microbe, a biography of a planet. I mean, it just goes on and on and on. And this really, you know, I just didn't know what to make of this. I thought, is this just some, you know, uh, catchy way of marketing books that somehow saying the story of isn't good enough, that has to be a biography. Uh, but as I thought about it, I thought, well, when you say biography of an X, and X is not a person, you are anthropomorphizing your subject, that you're treating it as if it were a person. And even if just, you know, in the title. Um, and I thought, well, when it comes to languages, we actually do talk about languages as if they were human beings a lot. We talk about languages as being in families. We talk about the health of languages. We talk about languages dying. These are all anthropomorphizations of language, the language as if it were a person. And when it comes to Yiddish, there's actually quite an extensive um, range of discussions of the language uh, as if it were a person. And this was getting me interested in the idea of writing this book. I thought that's an important issue because a book about Yiddish should not only tell the story of the language, but the story of how the language has been talked about, how it has been conceptualized, how it has been studied, how it has been imagined. This is really key for understanding Yiddish past, present, and future. So at this point, I, I, I was kind of interested in the idea of writing this book. And then I had to think about how to organize it because that was you know, up to me, it wasn't up to the press. And I thought about, well, you know, chronological, that's not really gonna work. And geographical, not gonna work. And ideological is not gonna work. And spheres of activity, not, not quite right. And at a certain point I thought, okay, this is a biography. Let it be a biography. And, and to create a series of thematic chapters that follow the headings of a biographical profile. Like, you know, those forms we're asked, asked to fill out about ourselves that say name, date and place of birth, gender, education, place of residence and so on. And I thought that would be really interesting. So at that point, I drew up a proposal and sent it to the press. And I thought, well, they're either gonna like it or they won't, but they did. And uh, then I had to write the book. So what's, what's key is uh, I never would have written this book on my own initiative, but I'm pretty sure when the press was looking for somebody to write the book, they did not think it was be anything like this. So it's an interesting confluence of two different uh, ideas of the possible. And were any of the chapters harder than others to conceptualize or did, did they not fit as well into that rubric? Um, well, what's interesting is uh, when I first drew up a list, I think there's a total of 14 now, 
And originally I had 12, then I added a 13th. Then I showed it to my partner. Uh, I said, what do you think? And he said, what about personality? I said, what do you mean personality? He said, you know, people think Yiddish is a personality. And I thought, oh, how can I, how could I not include that? And, you know, this is why you have to show your work to people, you know, early on so that they have ideas you don't have. So that was one that um, uh, just hadn't even been on my radar. And of course, once it was put on my radar, it became actually a really important chapter uh, uh, as part of the story. So um, it wasn't a sort of inevitable structure. And uh, as I was developing it also, um, figuring out what goes where in this rubric was also, you know, some things are pretty straightforward. But I remember one thing that um, I wasn't quite sure what to do with for a while was where I wanted to discuss dictionaries, which of course are an extremely important part of the story of well, any language that has a dictionary and certainly Yiddish, the Yiddish dictionaries are absolutely fascinating. And um, where, I, where was I gonna put them? Should they be in a chapter on education? And I just sort of didn't fit there. Should it be in the chapter on literacy? That chapter is already getting kind of long. And then I thought, well, what's really interesting is not only the dictionaries themselves, but the people who create them, the lexicographers. And that at a certain point, um, the, you know, the field of Yiddish lexicography as a modern practice happens in the middle of the 19th century in Eastern Europe. And at the same time, more or less, you have the first editor of a modern Yiddish periodical, the first modern uh, novelist, you have the first uh, playwright and impresario, all within a couple of decades of one another in Eastern Europe, mostly in the Russian Empire. Um, and it's because it's this very particular moment in Jewish history in Eastern Europe, but also linguistic history, um, where um, you start to develop modern Yiddish professionals. And that's where I decided I'm gonna talk about dictionaries as um, a profession and as part of a whole range of professionalizing the language and of making a living professionalizing the language. So that was one where um, it took me a while to figure it out. Yeah, I loved that chapter and I hadn't thought about professional uh, I mean, I thought about professional Jews and professional linguists, but professional Yiddish people and not just Yiddishists, but, uh, but yeah, that was a really interesting construct. And I guess you and I are both in that category to some extent, right? Yes, we are. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, so who, who do you see as the main audience for this book or the multiple audiences? Um, well, I actually think this is a book with two audiences and... Uh, that's partly because of the nature of the series and the nature of what I wanted to write. On one hand, this book is meant to be um, an introduction to the language to people who don't know much about it or don't know anything about it. Uh, that was uh, part of the, you know, the vision of the press for this series. Um, and uh, for that reason, um, they all, that was also why it's not a particularly long book because while well, they said you could, the structure is yours, but the length is ours. It can't be any longer than 80,000 words, including the footnotes, which may sound like a long book, but actually isn't for a big topic like this. So I have to be very concise. Um, it's also because this is a book in English, um, I felt this is a sort of gateway book to people who want to know more. Wherever possible, I gave references for further information, for further reading in English, even though there's so much work in Yiddish, in Hebrew, in German, in Russian, in French, and other languages. Uh, so that partly was that audience. But the other audience was, I figured there are going to be folks like you, Sarah, people who do know the language, you know about the language, and what can I offer you? not so much necessarily new information, but new ways of thinking about the language. How might we, uh, you know, interrogate the way people have been conceptualizing the language and writing about the language and studying it so that we might, um, you know, uh, rethink the possible um, as uh, people who, who study Yiddish in various ways or who work in Yiddish in various ways can, uh, can think about new, new possibilities. Yeah, I think that is one of the major contributions of your book is to focus not just on 
the history of the language, but on the ideologies about the language. And that's such an important part of research on language in general. So, and I think it really, it, it makes sense to include that in a biography of a language. Um, so I also am curious um, about all of the, the scholarship that you cited. You cited so many scholars from the history of Yiddish to Yiddish literature, from political movements to queer culture. And I was wondering if there was anything in that huge body of scholarship that you reviewed for this book that surprised you. Um, well, you know, it was very interesting exercise. It was like doing my comps all over again. Yeah. And in fact, um, so I reread a lot of things I read in graduate school, which was, you know, back, back some decades ago. Um, and then of course, looking at new scholarship. And I think what, if there's one thing that I was struck by was that when you look at the development of the study of Yiddish over time and uh, really going back to a century or more ago uh, and into the present is that you see, and of course this is, it's not surprising, it has become more specialized and more siloed into different disciplines. Uh, so you have the people who write about Yiddish literature uh, they don't necessarily write about language or linguistics. So you have the people who are the cultural anthropologists, you have the people who are the linguists, and some of them are sociolinguists, some of them are historical linguists, you have the people who are interested in old Yiddish, and, and, and there are these, you know, subfields, these specialties that have, uh, uh, that have emerged, and when you go back in time, the uh, pioneers of this field were much more uh, interdisciplinary, and uh, partly because I think they're trying to, you know, put a field up on its feet and they want to demonstrate its possibilities, its length and its breadth. Uh, but uh, they also, I think, as, uh, uh, as scholars were, um, were less uh, defined by uh, a particular discipline. Uh, the way scholarship very much is now, which is, I think, true of Jewish studies generally. Um, and um, uh, so that that was one uh, sort of key uh, trend. And the other thing that's interesting uh, is the extent to which um, uh, people's uh, convictions, whether it's about Yiddish or about Jews, uh, uh, about, you know, politically, culturally, religiously, what have you, uh, how those uh, shape scholarship, how they um, sometimes are very foregrounded, sometimes every effort is made to uh, be dispassionate, and it's, it's kind of a roller coaster. Um, it's not that uh, people used to be very ideological and now they're not anymore. I would say that um, uh, to me, it's quite interesting to see more recent scholarship um, uh, by people who are, on the one hand, you know, very rigorous in their work, but clearly um, there are aspects of what the language means to them that are driving the work. Uh, which in, in, in an interesting way echoes some of the earliest work on Yiddish, uh, even though the ideas are very different. But the idea that, of writing about Yiddish as having uh, a polemical as well as scholarly agenda, uh, uh, intellectual agenda, that, uh, that I think has uh, come more to the fore, um, and, and not universally, but in, uh, you know, among some scholars. And that's quite an interesting thing to see. Can you give some examples of that from more recent scholarship? So I think one, one of the things is um, uh, you see it in work on gender and sexuality. Uh, and I've, I think this is typical of scholarship on gender and sexuality is that it's it's engage scholarship. It's very uh, not, not interested in being dispassionate and actually thinks dispassionate is um, you know, a false friend. And so you definitely see it uh, in, in there. That may be the most obvious example, but I think there are other examples as well. Yeah, and I think I, I wanna talk a little more about that, that issue of ideology and engaged scholarship. Wh wh where do you see yourself in some of these debates? You talk about, well, let me just first tell you the, the audience about some of the debates that you talk about, mm -hmm. um, about the origins of Yiddish. And I would love for you to say a little more about that one because that one is so contentious uh, about the personality of Yiddish, the usefulness of Yiddish, 
the relationship between Yiddish and other languages, especially Yiddish and German. Um, and uh, so I guess I'm curious, what are some of your ideologies about Yiddish and where do you fall in some of these debates? Okay, well, um, some of these debates, um, I, uh, as we say in Yiddish, I don't have a dog in that hunt. Um, it's Southern Yiddish, right? And um, uh, so, uh, so like the origins of the language, um, and it, first of all, it's 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 not it's not my specialty, and it's also it's not where my passion is. Uh, in general, I'm less interested in where things come from than where they go. So, and on one hand, I'm really I'm I'm kind of in awe of people who you know, look at the origins of yet or of anything, you know, like, uh, you know, these uh, you know, physical anthropologists who like, you know, they find a jawbone in a desert somewhere and they extrapolate from this a hominid and can tell you the, the, what this uh, being looked like and lived like. And I'm just, how can you do that? You got a jawbone, you know? But, and of course, uh, people doing origins of languages are doing something similar is they've got a word. Uh, they've got, uh, you know, a sentence. They've got, you know, uh, a reference in another language. Got, you know, it's, um, uh, to me, it's, um, it's, it's both very impressive, but also I look at it and I think, you know, this is speculative. It's informed speculation, uh, uh, but it is speculative. And therefore, you have to think about what is informing the speculation intellectually, but also ideologically. And this is really key for the people arguing about, you know, the, the origins of Yiddish, where and when. And um, when I was thinking about how to write about this, especially because it, uh, it isn't what I focus on as a scholar. I, I was very concerned about what to do here because in other books on Yiddish, basically see one of two things. You either say, this is the story of where Yiddish comes from, they're very certain, and they either ignore or are dismissive of other theories. Or you have people who say, yeah, some people say this, some people say this, some people say this, take your pick. And neither one of those was quite satisfactory for me. And as I was, really, you know, just scratching my head, trying to figure out what to do. I remember once just in a sort of fit of frustration saying, you know, nobody even asks this question until the 19th century. And that's because nobody asks about where language comes from or where particular languages come from until a very particular moment in Western scholarship, early 19th century, basically, right? And that, and then I thought that's, the story. The story is that however long this language was around, nobody paid attention, whether internally or externally, the speakers of the language or other people looking at it who don't speak the language, nobody really, you know, raised this as a question until a certain moment where, where languages come from became an important subject and became an important subject, not only for linguistic reasons, but for other reasons as well. And one of the things I think one learns certainly from studying Yiddish and other languages as well, uh, but it's really clear in Yiddish, that whenever you're talking about language, you're always talking about something else as well. And in the case of Yiddish at this moment, the, what people are talking about are um, national identities, and racial identities, and uh, that figuring out where Jews do or don't fit in Europe or in the human race was an issue that redounded to how people were looking at Yiddish and to a lesser extent, the other languages they speak. But the focus really was because of where the scholarship was taking place was on Yiddish. And so that drives a lot of um, the way people have theorized the language and that actually continues into more recent theories besides you know 19th century and early 20th century theories. So it sounds like your role is more unengaged scholar. I, I would say here in, in, in that particular debate. Yeah, in this particular area, um, because, um, because I see it all as uh, a set of theories that, <laughs> excuse me, that tell us at least as much about um, 
who's doing the theorizing as what the theory is. I think that that to me is what 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 captures my attention and what I can contribute uh, to the discussion. And the, the debate will keep on. Uh, you know, it's uh, I, I'm not looking to have the final word, but I'm looking for is to say as we look at the debates, let's think about you know the the context in which they take place uh, intellectually and historically and culturally. So were there any debates where you did come down on one side or the other or where you do have an opinion that you'd like to, to share with us? So one, I mean, you sort of alluded to this was like about the usefulness of the language. And, you know, this is something, uh, you know, when I would give talks about Yiddish, you know, the, there's a, the certain questions that invariably come up from the audience. And one of them is, what's the point of learning this language? What can you use it for? And this used to just annoy the hell out of me, this question. I just thought it was really kind of, you know, insulting. And I realized I had to push beyond getting my back up. And what I have done when this comes up in an audience, you know, in front of, uh, you know, like a, a public talk, I would say, uh, how many of you ever took piano lessons or violin lessons, right? Were you studying the violin or the piano because you were going to be a concert musician? Show of hands, right? No, there's a lot of people take music lessons. Nobody, very few people have the aspiration that they're going to use it in a professional way. Or even, I'm going to become a music teacher. I'm going to become an accompanist. To, you know. No, you studied it, uh, assuming it was your choice and not your parents, uh, uh, for uh, as an end in itself. And for the both the pleasure of reaching a certain level of accomplishment, you can play a Mozart sonata, you can play a Joplin rag, or the process of learning, right? And it's the same thing with language. That learning Yiddish as an end in itself uh, is of enormous value. And to think of it in utilitarian terms, uh, not only Yiddish, but learning any language is to re really diminish uh, the possibilities of what you can get out of learning another language. And uh, to me, learning Yiddish, whoever you are, your grandparents spoke Yiddish, I don't care. You're not Jewish, I don't care. Anybody who learns this language is going to go on a very interesting intellectual and cultural and ideological journey because of the issues that the language raises. And you see them from the get-go. Um, and the further you go, the more uh, rich and complicated you realize are the places learning this language can take you. So to me, you know, there I do have, um, I have a stake in the ground uh, about uh, the value of, of, of learning the language. And, uh, you know, part of the challenge is, I think, especially uh, making this case in the United States where people tend to be fiercely monolingual and um, that the idea of learning any other language um, seems uh, excessive and there had better be a good reason. Um, and, uh, of course, a utilitarian reason would be strong rather than, oh, it looks interesting. So I think that, um, you know, that that's an argument one has to, to, to make, uh, especially in the American context for the value of, uh, of studying this language um, and other languages as well. Yeah, I like that analogy with music lessons and I would extend that to learning about a language that mm -hmm. when, um, that's what, what we're doing now, right? That we are, uh, talking about a language, we're not actually speaking Yiddish and, uh, oh, but we can read Yiddish together. Yeah, but we can read Yiddish in another uh, context, yeah? Yeah. Okay, uh, so, but yeah, I mean, that's, that's what we're doing now. We're talking about a language and we are, um, you can think about that like a music appreciation class that yeah that's um, a very good analogy yeah, yeah so if you're not going to study a language but you're going to learn about a language it's kind of like you're not going to study an instrument but you're going to take a music appreciation class maybe a class about Beethoven or a class about jazz or something like that and 
and and and get a better understanding of it, which enriches your your thinking. And that's exactly what your book is. Your book is music appreciation class for Yiddish, <laughs> right? It is. And I think one of the things that I would say is, and this goes for music as well as language, is um, uh, if you want to get a more intense understanding of what you're interested in, um, getting in there and, you know, trying to play the piano, getting in there and, you know, learning even some of the language, it will, um, it will force you to engage um, with um, uh, with the subject in, in in a very particular, more uh, more direct, more intense ways, and it may inspire you then to understand. Uh, I know that you know um, you know as, uh, as someone who did study piano for many years, um, and who you know really would like to get back to it. You know, one of the reasons uh, I would like to is because I do listen to a lot of performance. And um, I'm interested to, you know, feel my way into what those musicians are doing, even though I'm, you know, I'm not going to be in their lead. But uh, just um, the um, uh, the moment of engagement, uh, and I think that's true of, uh, you know, uh, learning a language, even at the most basic level. There's a, there's a, a a very intense kind of engagement that um, uh, I, I think can be very fruitful. Yeah, that's true, and even. Yiddish classes include a lot of metalinguistic com conversation, you know, conversation about the language. Um, and that's true for learning any language. Maybe learning Yiddish has a little more of that because it has so many components. Uh, and so there's a lot of talk about, well, this is a Hebrew origin word, or this word is used more in contexts where Deutschmarisch is considered okay, Deutschmarisch being the, the more German, uh, form of a particular word. Um, and, and so, well, do you think that Yiddish is unique in this way, that because of its many components and its layered history, perhaps it, 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 a language learning context would include more metalinguistic conversation than some other languages? That's a really good question. I, I think um, the, certainly the fact that it does you know, integrate all these different components uh, and um, and because I mean, really, the key thing about Yiddish also is it's a language that's never stood alone, and it is formed by contact with other languages, and uh, that therefore an attention to um, what its components are, what its boundaries are, um, what disputes there are over the boundaries, words that one person will say, I, I, that's not Yiddish, another person will say, my grandmother used that word, thank you very much. So you have, um, uh, you know, a, a lot of issues that can come up right away about the constitution of the language um, that um, I don't think, it's not this it doesn't happen with other languages, but it will happen in a distinctive way uh, because of the range of contacts, uh, because the range of kinds of speakers. So uh, people who know Yiddish from different dialects, people who know Hasidic Yiddish versus uh, secular Yiddish, um, uh, where there's sort of ideological as well as you know linguistic is uh, issues at stake. Um, uh, people who know uh, cognate languages, uh, related languages, I mean, certainly people who know German, people who know um, whether it's uh, uh, Hebrew or, you know, Israeli, you know, it's, 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 um, uh, there are always these points of intersection that learners are uh, making connections uh, with. And, uh, and, uh, and because those connections sometimes come with um, issues of significance. So I saw you put up about um, the, uh, uh, the uh, three words uh, for book um, that um, uh, are used in Yiddish. Uh, you have uh, Buch, which is related to the German Buch, which means a non-sacred book in Yiddish, whereas in German, it means a book. You have Sefer, which means, oh, you're gonna put it up, great. Um, you have Sefer related to uh, modern Hebrew, Sefer, which in Hebrew, it's any book, in Yiddish, it's a sacred book. 
And then we have a Knia, uh, which you have in, um, in Belarusian, maybe some other Slavic languages, which means book. I mean, in, in Russian, it's Kniga, um, but it refers to uh, one of the, the four stomachs of a cow, which looks like a book which um, I didn't really believe until I saw some of it. it was, I looked in a book on, on uh, shechita and kosher slaughtering and they show you what it looks like. And yeah, it looks like a book. So, um, so the fact that you, you, know, you draw from these different sources, these words um, uh, acquire a meaning that's tied to cultural practice. Um, right away you're learning things that are uh, uh, culturally as well as linguistically significant. And all right, Knia, you might not learn in your uh, first uh, class on Yiddish, but Sefer and Buch, I, you know, is something that will come up, um, I, I think, very often and as a way to introduce uh, different components, making different contributions uh, to, uh, to the language. Yeah, and here, I'm going to show another fun fact, or a few others that, that demonstrate the different components here. Um, this one is, uh, so several of these fun facts came from your book. Um, this is one that we published before your book came out, I think. Um, so this one is uh, Benedice or bench. What are the origins of the Yiddish word bench? The Yiddish word bench comes from Judeo-Italian Benedice. Jews speaking a Jewish version of German didn't want to use the German word for bless, Zeganin, because it also meant to make the sign, as in make the sign of the cross. So they maintained a word that their grandparents used, perhaps, who spoke Judeo-Italian, which shows the different streams of influence in Yiddish, not just Hebrew words and Slavic words, but also several words from Romance languages, likely Judeo-Italian, but it could also be some other uh, Romance language like French. Old French, um, yeah. Yeah, uh, and then here's another another one. This influence, this demonstrates some Slavic influence that in Yiddish, a word for ladybug is Moishe Rabbeinus Kiele, which means literally Moses, our teacher's little cow. And this was adapted from a Slavic term for ladybug, which is Mary's cow, Mary's little cow. Um, but instead of Mary, Jews said Moses. So, so here, you uh, both of these examples show influences from other languages, but they also show the idea of lahavdil loshin, which I think you talk about in the book, this idea that Jews want to Judaify their language. They want to distinguish it from the language of their non-Jewish neighbors. And that's, of course, the case for German, um, that, you know, you, you since Yiddish is Germanic, essentially, they Jews want to make it a more Jewish German than, than the German spoken by Christians, right? And, but that's also the case for influences from Italian and influences from Slavic that Jews want to Judaify those, those terms as well. Um, and that, that leads, well, actually, maybe you have something to say about that, and then I have a question about that. Okay, I guess um, one of the things I wonder is to what extent um, the, you know, it, it, uh, intention is, um, oh, we must make our language more distinct. Um, uh, and to what extent language choices sometimes were just automatic uh, without, they were not self-conscious. And I think, um, you know, uh, in the first centuries of this language's existence, I don't think there was a kind of self-consciousness about, you know, components of language and register and all this kind of stuff that does start to emerge like uh, mid late 18th century with uh, the enlightenment and then the, the Haskalah, uh, so-called Jewish enlightenment that uh, creates a new kind of self-consciousness about uh, Jewishness writ large, including Jewish language use. Before that, I don't know uh, how self-conscious uh, these uh, uh, choices always were. Um, and, um, you know, some cases, uh, maybe yes, but some, uh, 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 not necessarily. Um, so it's, um, I think it's a challenge, uh, looking back in time 
about uh, uh, the earlier form of the language, what modern ideas we have about how language works and how languages distinguish themselves from one another, were they always operative? And one of the things I was, uh, you know, struck by was um, the naming of Yiddish as uh, a distinct language, uh, uh, whether you call it Yiddish or some other word, um, consolidates fairly late in the game and early on, uh, it's sometimes not clear when people talk, for example, about teich, which is a word you'll see in old Yiddish texts. Are they talking about what we would call Yiddish or are they talking about what we would call German? And I've come to the conclusion that we can't always be sure. And maybe they weren't really so, you know, saw this as such a uh, an essential uh, distinction the way we would want it to be now. So this to me is um, this is one of the con uh, questions that emerged for me looking at the sort of long haul of, of the language um, uh, is, um, you know, how, you know, how do our conceptual possibilities uh, for Yiddish, you know, were they operable, you know, 500 years ago? I don't know. Uh, I'm not always so sure. Yeah, and that's a really important question uh, when we think about analyzing Jewish languages in the Middle Ages or even antiquity. And in my work, I argue that we should look to the present to get ideas for things to analyze in the past. Mm -hmm. But we have to be careful because the context was very different and it was very... Um, it, it, you're right that it, it's the modern period, the Enlightenment, that leads to certain ways of thinking about language that they might not have had before. However, I do think we can still analyze language of the past with the with the notion of distinctiveness um, mm -hmm. when we're talking about Jews, because Jews always lived in the context of non-Jews. In, in, even if they lived in an all Jewish neighborhood, they probably had some contact with Jews at most points throughout history, with non-Jews at most points throughout history. And you actually make a point in the book. This is where I felt like you kind of came down on one side of a debate where you talked about the idea of distinctiveness as a mode of analysis. And you problematized this approach for Yiddish saying that it shouldn't, that Yiddish shouldn't be analyzed in relation to German. It should be analyzed as its own language. Um, and so I guess that gets to what you were saying before, and maybe I misunderstood where you were coming down on that debate, but I was wondering what you think about that. Well, I think there, uh, and perhaps I wasn't uh, clear enough, there I was looking at in, in, you know, the difference between uh, Germanist scholarship, where scholars were measuring Yiddish against uh, German, and basically wherever it was different, it was defective, right? And then you had Yiddishist scholarships who said, no, this isn't defective German. It is Yiddish. It has its own form. It follows its own patterns. And I think, you know, the issue of difference, I think about um, something Max Weinreich, who was one of these champions, early champions of, you know, a Yiddish centered scholarship rather than the German centered scholarship. He said, uh, you know, the, you know, the, the, the a central activity in Jewish life is um, drawing a line between what's Jewish and what isn't. And he says, it doesn't matter where you draw the line. What matters is that you draw the line. And so, which to me is quite uh, interesting in that it, um, it suggests that one has to look um, you know, in a very sort of uh, uh, um, contingent way on uh, how Jews seek to distinguish themselves. Um, and I, I think one of the things that I, I, and I know one of the focus in your, your, your work um, is about, you know, th that, you know, how Jews distinguish their language from their neighbors. So like to work on Jewish English, which is like basically, how is it different from some kind of standard English, right? Whatever that is, right? But things that are, you know, Jewish markers, uh, you know, grammatically, vocabulary, and intonation, all kinds of things, right? Um, and, um, 
you also have a very important idea for me about the idea of the linguistic repertoire. That if you wanna, rather than talking necessarily about discrete languages that are sort of separate clumps, but that there's a repertoire that people draw from. And that to me was actually very a liberating idea to think about, um, uh, you know, language in, in, in a kind of fluidity, uh, including um, the efforts that Jews will make to not sound Jewish, to not speak something Jewish. And I think about, I mean, you know, the efforts of German Jews to put Yiddish behind them and to speak perfect, idiomatic uh, uh, German. And that that's usually looked at as, you know, an act of assimilation, deracination. And I look at it as actually a Jewish act. It is a Jewish act to make the effort to sound like the people who were born speaking this language, because you weren't. You have to make the effort, and the effort is what distinguishes you. And the same thing happened with Polish, right? Jews who are Polonizing and are looking to, uh, you know, fit in in Poland, and in especially interwar years when they have access to uh, education uh, in Polish language schools, and um, that uh, it is an effort that distinguishes you from the people who don't have to make that effort because it is their first language. And for you, it is, is not your first language. And in both cases, the effort uh, generates an awareness by the non-Jewish neighbors monitoring this. So Germans look at Jews speaking German and are listening for where it's not just quite uh, right. And they identify this as Mauschlin or Yudlin, talking German like a Jew. And you have the same thing in Polish. I'm not sure if I'm pronouncing the word right, Zidwacic, which means to talk Polish like a Jew. And so this, um, uh, that effort is also because it's part of the linguistic uh, repertoire is what can I take out of my repertoire? What does it take to take it out of my repertoire? Um, to me, this is, um, uh, this is also Jewish language use. I don't think it gets the same attention that where we see things that have Jewish markers in them, uh, because that that just sort of more readily fits, you know, that idea of you know where do you draw the line, right? Um, but um, the effort to get rid of the line is actually something to pay attention to. Yeah, right. And I think we, when we talk about um, post migration Yiddish, that is, you know, you, you mentioned German Jews trying to not sound Jewish. That doesn't work for Jews in Poland. Uh, they can't just try to speak German like their neighbors, although there are German, non-Jewish, not German speakers in Poland. But when Jews are in Slavic lands or Hungary or Lithuania, they are, the language around them is a completely different language from a different language family. And so in that case, and also in the case of Sephardic Jews who speak Judeo-Spanish or Ladino in Turkey or Greece or Yugoslavia, those are what I refer to as post-co-territorial languages. That is, mm -hmm. they're no longer co-territorial with the language that is the basis for their the non-Jewish version of their language, right? And um, so it, it's a very different calculus when they're trying to de-Judeify their language, they just have to speak a totally different language. Right. Right. Um, yeah, yeah, any thoughts about that? No, it's quite interesting the, the way that, um, you know, what, what is the sense of possible when you move, and it's probably true for other, you know, uh, you know other immigrants generally, you move, what is your sense of possible for, uh, you know, language use in terms of, you know, maintenance, uh, abandonment, hybridization, um, and um, this, uh, and, and of course, what we often see with um, immigrant communities in these, uh, uh, you know, uh, that have moved to, uh, uh, you know, lands where they're encountering a completely different language, different language family, different alphabet, I mean, all kinds of things, um, 
is the extent to which um, uh, and in what ways um, uh, bilingualism and code switching emerge as being an immigrant, you are, uh, your life is negotiating where you came from and where you are now. Uh, and not only linguistically, but in all kinds of ways, but it winds up manifesting a lot in language. And um, I remember a conversation I had with you was actually very helpful when I was trying to understand, you know, looking at code switching uh, practices. This was in another project I was working on. And uh, when people were speaking Yiddish and when they were speaking English, and um, people had all these theories. This is about interviews with Holocaust survivors. And so people had all these theories about, oh, they're going back to their childhood. Oh, they're dealing with trauma. And I'm thinking like, I'm just not hearing that. I think they're all over the place. And I remember asking you and you said, you know, sometimes people just switch, we don't know why. And that was actually very helpful to, real, to think about to what extent there is a del deliberation about now I'm using language A, now I'm using language B, and to what extent things are kind of automatic, uh, including in, in, in language that gets very merged, where you know every other word is a different language. So um, you know that um, I, I think is uh, you know part of also what makes tracking um, uh, Yiddish as it travels uh, to different places um, how it um, um, uh, negotiates these different uh, linguistic boundaries. Of course, this is going on today with people who study Hasidic Yiddish, because Hasidic Yiddish in uh, Brooklyn, Hasidic Yiddish in uh, uh, Jerusalem, Hasidic Yiddish in Antwerp, uh, uh, in Montreal, they're in different linguistic co contexts and, um, uh, and, and, it, and it shows up in their language. Right, and uh, more recent scholarship in um, language contact talks about this idea as translanguaging that that it's you're not just speaking one language or another language and then mixing them. You're just speaking the language that you speak, which includes what other people might think of as two separate languages, and and that gets at the issue we were talking about before about fluidity and and the permeable boundaries between what people normally think of as separate languages. Um, I want to make sure to leave time for questions, and there are several questions in the chat. Feel free to put other questions in the chat. And uh, let's start with um, a question about your writing. Uh, Ruth asks, how long did it take to write the book? Oh, um, gee, I'm not so sure. Uh, a couple of years. Um, you know, uh, from start to finish, maybe a little longer, just because when you think you're done, you send it to the editor, you send it to the copy editor, you know, uh, it turns out you're not done. So uh, a couple of years. And uh, I should say, um, part of the time I worked on it, um, I had a, a, a fellowship um, at, at Harvard's uh, Center for Jewish Studies um, that was devoted to the study of language and literature. And it was, enormously helpful to have time just to sit and write there. And uh, one of the best things about this fellowship, in addition to the fact that the other fellows were, were, were very interesting to meet and to talk with, was that the weather was horrible. I was there in the winter and I just, you know, hunkered down and wrote. So uh, it actually probably got done a little faster than it would have had I not had that, uh, that opportunity and uh, a nor'easter every week. May we all have bad weather when we're trying to write a book. Yeah, I guess. <laughs> um, um, Miri asks, what can you say about the personality of Yiddish that speaks to its uniqueness? And that gets at questions we were talking about before about how unique is Yiddish in certain ways? Well, one of the things that is interesting to note about uh, people assigning a personality to Yiddish is these personalities are all over the place. So this is a language with uh, multiple personality disorder. Uh, it is a language of piety. It is a language of raucousness. It is a language of sentimentality. It is a language of revolution. It is, a, I mean, you name it. And to me, what was interesting about uh, the, you know, beyond the range was when does this happen? And it largely happens as people are looking at Yiddish from a distance. When you're in it and using it every day, it's a language you speak. Um, and they say, I don't think of English as having a personality because I'm talking in English all the time. Um, 
but uh, were I to look at English from a distance as someone who didn't speak it fluently or spoke it only occasionally um, or was studying it, I, I might make observations, especially based on where I'm coming from linguistically that ascribe to it a personality. And this is something that I saw happening among people who um, didn't know the language or didn't know much about it, um, or people trying to explain Yiddish to others where uh, in order to uh, convey its value, its extra linguistic value, its cultural value, um, ascribe to it uh, a, a personality. And so that to me was really key in understanding the, the range of, uh, of personalities that get um, attributed to the language. Um, so uh, yeah, that was actually uh, a, a quite an interesting chapter to pull together all these different ways of talking about the language uh, as having a particular character, which on the one hand reduces it. I mean, you know, it, it, meaning if you think of it as essentially a pious language, can you be irreverent in it? Or you, if you think of it as an essentially raucous language, you know, can you be serious in it? Um, and um, on the other hand, it suggests that every everything uttered in, in the language has an extra register of meaning. Um, that everything is inherently funny or everything is inherently devout or everything is inherently provocative or inherently ironic or what have you. And um, so, uh, you know, those implications are worth considering what, what they do to the way people think about the language. Yeah, what you're talking about is the distinction between speaking a language as a vernacular and as a post vernacular and that notion of post vernacularity comes from your book adventures in Yiddish land post vernacular language and culture. Um, and um, I mean, I, I recommend all of Jeffrey Chandler's books, uh, but that book in particular had a big impact on me uh, and my understanding of 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 language and so. Um, I, oh, and Hannah just put that in, in the chat. Um, and um, the so my question about that actually relates to the organizations that are our co-sponsors. And we're not ending yet, but I'm just going to show you uh, the logos and, and see what you notice. Can you see that at the bottom there? Jeffrey? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes. OK, so aside from our logo, um, what do you notice about the other five logos down here? Uh, so they um, they have olive base and they have English, and um, uh, sometimes one is a direct translation of the other, and sometimes the English is, offers more detail than uh, than the Yiddish. Yeah. And um, and we have uh, some fun fonts in there, uh, like the Ingeveb very sort of, you know, 20s constructivist kind of font. Right, right. And yeah, they're all different fonts. Uh, and you have, and you also have uh, Romanized Yiddish uh, in Yiddish Kite and in Ingeveb. Yeah. Uh, so, um, uh, so you've got uh, two languages, uh, th uh, three orthographic systems. Yeah, here, I'm just trying to make it bigger here. Let me, let me just, in case it's hard for people to see if they're on a little screen, um, oops. Hold on. Um, there. So um, yeah, there and um, and this really when I was putting together these logos, I was thinking about your book and thinking about all those things that you just said. Um, also, I was thinking about the uh, the orthography in the olive base versions that it's all standard, right? It's all yes. there's a little dot there under that yud, and uh, there's. Um, it, it has Comet the olive. Comet's Olive there, right? And there, and and it's so it, it's in, in contrast to, and also it has the Hebrew words spelled as it's originally spelled in Hebrew. So, it, and it's it, that's in contrast to Hasidic Yiddish, which doesn't use the exact same orthography. Mm -hmm. um, and also I noticed some, um, well, okay, I guess that's enough for now. But um, yeah, so any anything else you want to say about post-vernacularity as it relates to your current book? 
Right. So um, the whole idea of a post vernacular language is, um, and, and that whole project was to try and understand what happens to Yiddish after World War II. And, you know, I was studying as a graduate student uh, at the Evo Institute in Columbia, and the focus was on pre World War II. And very little was said about what happens to Yiddish afterwards, um, except as it's sort of vestigial. And uh, I remember when I told somebody I was going to write a book about Yiddish after World War II, and it was somebody who worked at Evo, and they said, well, that's a sad story. And I thought, not necessarily. I understand why that person of an older generation felt that way, but I felt the, um, this, this image of Yiddish as, you know, declinist after the war wasn't entirely accurate, and it really wasn't helpful intellectually or ideologically. And so I wanted to write about what, what is the language like in this post-war period after the devastating destruction of half the world's speakers of the language, its cultural center for centuries, other linguistic persecutions directed at Yiddish, including by other Jews. Um, and, uh, you, you know, is there a way to look at the language other than that, and instead of looking at what it isn't, let's look at what it is. And one of the things it has become increasingly is a language that is in what I call a post-vernacular mode, which is a mode where the fact that you're using Yiddish, that you're speaking it or writing it or reading it, has a significance in its own right, above and beyond whatever you're saying or writing or singing or what have you. And that to me was really key, that there was a new deliberateness about use of the language, and that this explained uh, not only a secular commitment to Yiddish and all the organizations that you just showed, but um, I would also say Hasidic Yiddish is, in its own way, has a deliberateness about it that was not the case before the war. Uh, before the war, uh, Hasidim who spoke Yiddish, especially in Poland, less so in Hungary, um, had neighbors who were Jews who were not Hasidic and some of whom were you know, far from Hasidic. They were very uh, uh, secular and radical and they had the language in common. Now the language is used as a gatekeeper to separate Hasidim from other Jews. And um, uh, I am one of a number of people who've had the experience of showing up in a Hasidic neighborhood as an obviously non-Hasidic person addressing people in uh, Yiddish and being answered in English because they don't speak Yiddish with people like me. And uh, so that's a very different engagement with the language and it's a new deliberateness about language, not just maintaining it, but maintaining it for a different reason. And um, so that's post vernacularity. And I think it is, uh, uh, it's key for understanding generally what happens to Yiddish in the last 75 plus years. And it's also, you know, the idea of the personalities of Yiddish, that's when they really begin to flourish in this new deliberate kind of attention to the language. Um, people see it as having a character of some kind. Yeah, and several of the questions in the chat have to do with those issues that you just raised. Um, I'll, I'll raise some of them. Um, Bruce talks about a sentence from an article in the forward uh, and I checked, it was from 2006. And the sentence is, it's the beginning of the article, if Yiddish has a future on college campuses, it may literally go unspoken. And the idea of the article was that that there were, uh, that grad students are learning Yiddish, but they're learning to read it, not, not learning it as a spoken language. Mm -hmm. um, and I'm gonna ask that in conjunction with um, another question, which is about the future of Yiddish. Uh, let's see. Um, Mindy asks, what is the thinking now about the future of spoken and written Yiddish, Yiddish in which countries, among which populations? Mm -hmm. So if you could address those two issues, please. Okay, so um, remember earlier I said, you know, there's certain questions you always get asked when you give a talk about Yiddish. So one of them is, what's the future of Yiddish? Another question that I hated being asked until I figured out the answer. And the answer is, expect the unexpected. And the reason I say that is because when I started studying Yiddish uh, in graduate school at Columbia University and at the Evo Institute in the early 1980s, um, if you were to tell me then 
some of the things that 40 years later are now happening with Yiddish, not only would I be surprised, so would all of my teachers. And they are uh, not directions in the, you know, they're not in decline, they're actually expansive, but in, um, in surprising ways uh, that really, um, uh, I, I don't think anybody then uh, would anticipate, um, including everything from, first of all, the 1980s, who knew that the Soviet Union was gonna collapse and that, you know, the, the East was gonna open up and that there will be new levels of encounters between Jews in Eastern Europe and the former Soviet Union and Jews in the West. Uh, much of it centered around Yiddish uh, language, literature, lore, music, uh, archival resources, but all kinds of things opened up and it was a bilateral engagement and quite an interesting one as people with different areas of expertise were coming into contact with one another in a way that they couldn't before. So that's one. Um, the emergence of certain developments around Yiddish in the Hasidic world, like Hasidic leisure, leisure fiction for adults, uh, all these, uh, you know, kids games and books and stuff in, in, in Yiddish uh, uh, for children, that was maybe just beginning to happen and now it's, uh, it, 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 it's enormous. Um, uh, the, uh, the impact of the internet on Yiddish is extraordinary. Uh, one of the most interesting examples uh, comes from the work of our, uh, our colleague, Ayala Fader, who has been studying how uh, Hasidim who um, are discontent with their communities but don't leave, uh, largely because they have families, and that would be a, a destructive, not just disruptive, but destructive move. Uh, remain in the communities, maintain the outward appearance of piety, but use the internet to blog with one another in Yiddish and in English about their theological doubts, about their discontent with their communities and have created a, a, a subculture uh, that, uh, that the internet enables that otherwise probably could not happen the way, the way it has happened. Um, uh, the emergence of queer Yiddishkeit which you just may be starting in, in mid 1980s when you really started to see this as a phenomenon taking shape. And to me, what was so fascinating about that was that was you know, a small group of people willing this into existence in the face of not only homophobia in the Yiddish speaking world, secular as well as religious, but uh, very negative attitudes towards religion and ethnicity in the gay and lesbian world by and large. Um, and, uh, but there were folks who wanted these two things brought together, uh, and not necessarily all for the same reason, and who uh, willed a phenomenon into existence that now has, uh, has spawned uh, a, a remarkable range of, of activities and uh, has, uh, has changed considerably as queer culture has changed. Uh, for, since uh, since the 1980s, uh, and there are other examples as well. So, like none of that was around, um, or or we could add Yiddish farm, or we could add Duolingo Yiddish. Uh, uh, all of these are new developments uh, that are things to watch, uh, just to see what um, what people uh, want to do with the language. I mean, I, what's interesting is uh, these are all voluntary activities. Um, nobody is mandating the learning of Yiddish uh, the way that other languages are, 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 are mandated. Uh, um, and to a certain extent, even in, in, in uh, Hasidic communities, uh, there's, um, you know, the, the, the way Yiddish is used and is learned is, um, it's, it's not a standard sort of language learning uh, practice as we would know it outside the Hasidic world, including the way we expect people to learn English, right? Um, and um, in, in public schools. And so, uh, so the, 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 the voluntary nature of this, on the one hand, it's very mutable, but on the other hand, um, uh, there are, th th there's lots of desire to do something with this language. These desires are all over the place, um, uh, but that's what makes it so interesting. 
Yeah, and you do talk in the book about all those unexpected things. And uh, so I highly recommend that anyone who's interested in this uh, purchase the book. And uh, in fact, Elizabeth uh, did that. She, she wrote, I'm encouraged by my grandson's interest in learning Yiddish. I gave him Jeffrey's book and he is more interested in learning than before. So it's, it's, it's having an impact, Jeffrey. You know, um, thank you. You made my day. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> That's good. That's good. Um, and uh, Mickey also writes on YouTube, search LA Yiddish Culture Club and Lilke Meisner to hear Yidd academic Yiddish spoken by native speakers. There's so much out there about Yiddish. Uh, and I wanna thank you, Jeffrey, before we um, end. Um, Jeffrey, do you have any final words before we turn it over to Hannah? Uh, no, I think I've, I've done a lot of talking and I want, just wanna thank you for uh, such uh, thought provoking questions, you and, and from folks in the, in the virtual audience. Thank you so much. And now we'll turn it over to Hannah to wrap us up. Thank you, Sarah. On behalf of the HUC JIR Jewish Language Project, I'd like to thank everyone in the audience for attending today's event. Thank you to our sponsors for their support, the California Institute of Yiddish Culture and Language, Congress for Jewish Culture, Ingeveb, a journal of Yiddish studies, Yiddishkeit, and the Yiddish voice, Dos Yiddishikol. And lastly, thank you again to Dr. Jeffrey Chandler for today's fascinating discussion about his new book, Yiddish Biography of a Language. It is always a pleasure to hear him speak about Mamaloshin, and his books have been very formative for my own thinking about Yiddish since I began studying it 20 years ago. Uh, so today was really a treat for me. Lashenim Dank. Dank. Part of the Jewish Languages Language Project's core mission is to regularly convene experts across disciplines, as well as speakers and heritage learners to share their findings and thereby raise awareness of Jewish languages, both their rich history and their current precariousness. We provide these programs to the public free of charge so that all can come and learn. The Jewish Language Project is a nonprofit organization and we rely on your support to keep our initiatives going. This is critical time sensitive work in the field of language preservation. And if you believe in this mission, we'd love to have your support. Our current documentation project is on Iranian Jewish languages, which are among the world's most endangered Jewish languages. Sarah is going to drop the campaign link in the chat, and you can also find the donation button on our homepage. Thank you for ensuring that future generations will be able to study this precious linguistic heritage. Today's event is the only one on our summer schedule, but we are already hard at work on programming for the upcoming academic year. On Sunday, September 11th, we're hosting a very interesting event entitled From Rachel and David to Maya and Ezra, Trends in American Jewish Personal Names. Mm -hmm. Dr. Benor and her colleague, Elise Chandler, will present the findings of a national survey about Jewish names and a panel of experts will offer commentary. We are also creating a new online exhibit highlighting women's voices in historical documents and songs in partnership with the Jewish Women's Archive and other organizations. This exhibit will focus on languages like Ladino, Judeo-Provencal, and Judeo-Arabic, and we'll be hosting at least two events on this topic in our fall calendar, so stay tuned. There are lots of ways to plug in to what's going on at the Jewish Language Project. Our website, jewishlanguages.org, has several exhibits, language resources like the Jewish English Lexicon, and an events page with info about upcoming programs, as well as an archive with videos from past events, including today's, which will show up in the next day or two, if you want to share it with friends. Also, if you're not already following us on social media, you can find the Jewish Language Project on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We post fun facts twice a week, as well as all the latest news related to Jewish languages. You can also subscribe to our YouTube channel. The very best way to keep up with all of our activities is to subscribe to our email list for occasional updates about events, programming, and research initiatives. Here at the Jewish Language Project, we believe that there is a world of history in every Jewish language, and each speaker has something to teach us. Thank you again for joining us for today's program with Jeffrey Chandler. Take care, and we hope to see you soon. <laughs>